And the last speaker of this session is Evan Elliott from bar -Ilan University. He will tell us about microbiome, epigenetic, genetic interaction in the development of autism spectrum disorder. Okay. So our previous lecture came from Berlin University in Ramat Gan. I come from Berlin University in Sfat. Um, and this is what you see on your bottom left and bottom right. That's the view of the canaries from our balcony. So even though we've been around for seven years, there's still many people who haven't visited us yet. If you haven't, please come uh, visit our faculty. Um, in my lab, I work on, uh, in uh, Sfat, so I work on two subjects, one on molecular mechanisms in the development of autism and another on the role of three-dimensional uh, genome structure in behavior. The second thing, of course, we won't talk about today. Um, what I would like to talk about is specifically some projects dealing with the microbiome in autism. Um, all these projects are born out of a collaboration. I'm sort of the neuroscience guy and Dr. Omri Koren in the faculty is the microbiome guy. And so we work together. And the microbiome, as you know, um, is basically the population of the uh, bacteria which lives within us. And in every one of our orifices or different parts of our body, we have a different population of bacteria, each necessary for different uh, bodily functions, which we live in symbiosis with them. Um, it's often said that if bacteria cells are the same size as human cells, then we would sort of be like a big blob of bacteria walking around with the human inner core because there's a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot more bacterial cells than our human cells in our in our body. Um, now, why? One of the things I want to point out is, of course, that this bacteria or the microbiome is incredibly important uh, for our health. And for example, when you have uh, mice that are germ-free, that you can uh, make mouse in a lab that has no uh, microbiome whatsoever, um, then it is a very sick mouse. Um, has a very poor immune uh, system, has much of its physiological functions are impaired because we live in symbiosis with the microbiome which helps us to uh, function correctly. Now, a lot of work has been done pre uh, recently in regards to the gut-brain access, um, which is uh, basically the communication between the gut and the brain. And how is it that things in the gut or that the bacteria can in any way um, affect the function of the brain or behavior for that matter. Um, for a few different mechanisms are proposed. Um, one of them is through neurotransmitters. First of all, some of the bacteria actually make neurotransmitters such as GABA. Um, but second of all, they definitely regulate the amounts of neurotransmitters and neurotransmitter precursors in our body. For example, most of the tryptophan, which was converted into serotonin, is actually produced in the gut. The bacteria in our gut metabolize the, trip out, the tryptophan. If we do not have proper amounts of certain bacteria, then tryptophan levels increase in the body, serotonin levels increase, and we have different behaviors based on that. Um, there are also different mechanisms uh, through which the uh, gut and the microbiome can uh, affect behavior. For example, um, we can look at its possible effects on the vagus nerve, or even more importantly, um, its effects on the immune response. As I said, of course, there's a constant uh, crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune response, and we know that many of the chemicals which the immune response um, secrete, such as cytokines, interleukins, have very important um, roles and processes in the brain as well. Now, why would I think that this is anything or of any particular interest to autism? First of all, one of the major comorbidities in autism are gastrointestinal problems. So seen in many families. Uh, of course, not in all, but in many families you'll see. And there's also been many works showing a association or a positive correlation between severity of gastrointestinal issues and um, other um, the more classic autism phenotypes of social behavior and, and repetitive uh, behaviors. Um, some of the suggested environmental factors which have been suggested to be involved in autism um, also very much affect uh, the microbiome and populations of microbiome in our body. Um, it is also well known that um, there's an association, first of all, between diet and our microbiome. And there's also many dietary changes um, that have been reported in individuals with autism as well, those who only will eat a certain type of diet and completely reject another type of diet. Um, and then that in and of itself may cause uh, certain issues in the microbiome or the other possible way as well where the microbiome might have some role in those dietary choices. Um, and what's most interesting for me as a researcher is the fact that microbiome findings are relatively perhaps easier to bring to translational to the clinic. In other words, for example, 
I have other projects looking at glutamate receptors and the striatum and impulsivity, right? But it seems to me we're much farther along. It takes much more, I don't know, it's more problematic to now try to figure out how I change glutamatic receptor signaling basically in a ventral striatum, da da da. Well, if, for example, we could just change or we can modulate uh, microbiome in the body through probiotics, then that could be a much easier and more translatable uh, method for uh, therapeutics. Um, so what has been shown until now? First of all, there have been a, uh, quite a few projects, I'd say somewhere between 10 and 20 in the world, um, looking at uh, how the microbiome changes in individuals with autism. Most of these studies are usually include around 30 to 50 individuals, somewhere in that uh, generally um, framework. And most of them will show some changes in the microbiome. Um, the major problem for us is that the changes don't seem to be very consistent between different studies. In other words, you'll see different changes happening in different studies, which um, can have many possible reasons, but one of the foremost, in my view, is the fact that most clinical settings that work in autism tend to work in slightly different populations in terms of their uh, clinical uh, presentation. Um, so at least looking at the papers, you'll find some that were reporting on more a low, um, what do you call it, more a low functioning or more of a high functioning group. Or, and as we know, since autism is such a spectrum, um, so it may be that none of these reports are able to really get the full spectrum and then they're, and they're to more closely associate between clinical presentation, which is most, what's most important, particular behavioral differences, and actually changes in uh, the microbiome. Um, just as a, to show that there has been a, oh, it's funny what happened there, but that there has been one study which has been done now in Arizona where they did a uh, preliminary pilot study of microbiota transfer. What does that mean? We basically took uh, dried up human feces from a normal normal, from a, from a neurotypical individual and transferred it um, to someone with autism. In this study, they did it on children who have gastrointestinal problems. They know that these children have gastrointestinal problems. They report in this study um, changes for improvement or improvement in autism behaviors, in social behaviors, repetitive behaviors. They show changes in their gastrointestinal um, function, etc. Um, there's still many uh, um, this is sort of a pilot study because for many reasons, first of all, we don't know what they gave in this capsule, basically. We don't know what bacteria was there, what other um, functions or what other things those, those bacteria may do. And um, so, yeah, so, what, so there's quite a few open questions you can see here. This is very much an open field. And a few questions I think are important is, first of all, to try to more close to go closer to understand what exact species may be changing. And in order to do that, we need to more closely associate between changes in microbio and certain species and um, the behavioral changes and repetitive behavior, social uh, behavior, et cetera. Um, another important question that I have is in terms of the genetics. Uh, we know that autism is very highly genetic, 60%, 70%, many different numbers out there. But there's a very strong um, place for genetics in autism. Now, when people talk about the microbiome and autism, they they're often think about the idea of some sort of behavioral, environmental factor changing the microbiome, whoops, therefore increasing the um, chance of autism. However, could it be that there's also some role for the genetics in autism as well? So we've been working on three projects. Um, one of them is a mouse model project. Uh, where we've been working on Shank 3 um, mice. These are mice which have mutation in a protein called Shank 3, which is associated with autism. And I'll show you some results from that in a minute. And our second project we've been working on, we recruited individuals that have chromosome 16B 11.2 deletion. Um, this is a deletion of 29 genes, of course, in one of the two alleles. Um, and what's interesting in this deletion, there's a few interesting things, um, but first of all, um, forget to mention it's associated with autism, and even those that do not have autism will have other, um, um, will have other intellectual disorders or, um, and usually also have social um, problems and social behavior even if it doesn't receive the diagnosis of autism. Now, another thing is that most of the genes found in this deletion have very little to do with the brain. They tend to have a lot more to do with immune response and even some that are um, found mostly in the gut. 
Um, and in our third study that where we have now been recruiting um, from individuals uh, diagnosed with autism here in Israel, uh, and we've made a, a health, how do you call it, a Ministry of Health um, approved biobank for autism here in Israel, and I'll discuss that in a minute. So in the first project, um, so what we did is we took these mice, I don't know if you can see it from here, but these are mice which have a mutation called, uh, in a gene called Shank3. Um, you can see up here perhaps that they have a um, wound in the back, which is usually by self-mutilation over grooming, which is a type of repetitive behavior in uh, mice models. Um, now, what we first did is we characterized their microbiome to see if they have any changes. When you ha so if you have this mutation, Shank3, does that cause changes in the microbiome? We're actually surprised to find rather large changes or robust changes in a few different genera of uh, microbiota. Um, the one that I pointed out or circled in red here, Lactobacillus. Um, is there here a... No pointer, no. So this Lactobacillus... Um, is a genera of bacteria, uh, which we found to be decreased both in uh, males and in females uh, mice. There are some differences, by the way, in microbiome between the two. Um, and also level of species, there was one particularly interesting, like the books of this root theory. Why was this interesting to us? First of all, there have been other reports showing that in mice, this bacteria actually modulates uh, social behavior. Um, second of all, it is a bacteria which actually excretes uh, GABA, um, there's one uh, manuscript suggesting that it actually, um, the excreted GABA can affect um, behavior through the vagus nerve. And the th there's a, uh, also actually two uh, studies showing that in humans, that if it gave to humans um, lactobacillus ruteri, that increased the levels of oxytocin in the serum. Um, so it's showing many different possible connections between lactobacillus and um, social behavior. So we took these mice, and administered to them for three weeks an active exodus materi, and did to them different behavioral tests that are done um, on mice when being a social behavior paradigm um, to see how much the test mouse will spend with a stranger mouse or in an empty container, this would be an empty uh, area, or how much it will uh, bury marbles, which is basically repetitive behavior in mice, and also for other uh, measures of hyperactivity and anxiety. Um, in summary, uh, what we find is that, in fact, when we gave them the lactobacillus ruteri to this mice, is that they did show now more social behavior. In other words, they spent more time with a stranger mice than an empty area, unlike without the bacteria. And they also showed a decrease in repetitive behaviors um, as measured by the marble bearing test. So this is done in male mice. Um, we also then checked uh, in parallel, actually, with the female mice. And there, we did see the same result in repetitive behaviors, but we did not see any improvement in social behaviors, even though I'd have to say that even the um, Shankly knockout mice females actually show from the beginning some social behavior. So there seems to be some differences between males and females um, um, in this effect and in these behaviors. Um, one thing which I'm sure, oh, you can sort of see that, um, is that we checked how does this affect the brain in fact, when you give this bacteria, does this really affect any molecular um, changes in the brain? So we checked both in the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex expression of GABAergic genes, in fact found a very large increase after giving lactobacillus ruteri in expression of a number of key receptors for the neurotransmitter GABA, which I said before, um, lactobacillus ruteri can actually express or um, make. We also then looked at the level of the protein in the brain and found very similar results, not as robust, of course, as the level of our mRNA, but we in fact find increases in the level of GABAergic receptors in the brain after giving uh, this bacteria. I'd also mention, I have no clue how to explain this, but it's just there. Uh, when we gave like, this rituri, as expected in males, we had an increase in oxytoc oxytocin um, um, expression in the brain in the hypothalamus. In females, uh, we did not have. Um, in, fact, in fact, we had actually the opposite effect. Um, so there it is. So that's sort of this preclinical study where we did in mice, and we show there um, that, in fact, we can actually give a particular bacteria which they're missing, and we can actually find differences in um, autism-related behaviors. 
So next step is, as I said, we want to now look and understand more really in the uh, human population. Um, can we see something just similar or what do we see? In our first um, study, uh, we looked at individuals who have this deletion, chromosome 16p11.2. And we took from them basic microbiome. They sent to us from the United States uh, their stool samples. And I can just tell the story that there was one family of one deletion and three siblings who told me that their whole Christmas break was also very exciting because the kids were so excited to go and, and take their stool samples and send it to us. So some people actually really like that. I don't know. <laughs> so in any case, um, so we, in this study, we recruited um, individuals through the Simons Foundation and did 16S sequencing, which is the method um, for finding out what species our bacteria have changed um, in individuals, or what, uh, I'm sorry, what is the microbiome population in individuals. The first thing is this is something called a principal component analysis. I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with such a thing. So what this basically is, is every person here um, is a dot. Every person in the study is a dot. And when two dots are very close to each other, like that red one and that blue one, what that means is that the microbiome of those two people are very similar. When you have two dots which are very far apart, like that one and that one, that means they have very different populations. So for example, this person apparently had a very different microbiome population than the other people. Now what you see here is that in red are control siblings and in blue are deletions. You do not have a very strong separation, like two corners with two different populations, but you can start to see a slight separation uh, between the two, I'm sorry, um, between the two populations in terms of their overall microbiome um, constituency. Uh, when you look at alpha diversity, what is alpha diversity? That is basically the diversity or the complexity of the microbiome. What I mean by that is if I have 900 types of bacteria in me, what does that mean? Really it does? Wow. And then if, they have, and then if the person next to me has um, 500 species, that person has less alpha diversity than me. Okay? If they just have less uh, types of species. So actually found that the complexity of microbiome does decrease in individuals with a deletion. Um, Another thing is now we're looking more closely at particular um, species that are changing between individuals. One of them which we found very strongly is a species called Christensenella. Christensenella very, also is very interesting for another reason. It was published in a, in a paper a few years ago that it is the species which is the most closely correlated to human genetics. And it was also a species found to be very highly correlated to BMI, to obesity or overweightness. And there's no these people, these individuals with deletion, tend to be overweight. And so it could be that this, again, that there's some um, um, connection between the two. Of course, perhaps Chris and Sutter are doing, Chris and Sanella are doing other things that we're not aware of. So we're going to start looking into that now. Um, so in this other project, uh, I'll just explain slightly, um, we're, we're a project that we're currently recruiting for. And this project is basically part of an overall program where we've done, a, a, like I said, a Ministry of Health approved autism biobank here in Israel, uh, where we've now been recruiting. First of all, we started recruiting in northern Israel and have now started slowly moving south, um, where we get from individuals biological samples, which include blood, saliva, and uh, stool. Uh, please conclude in I will include now. And so what we will be doing from that in terms of our project is we will be, um, the stool from the samples, of course, we'll be using and correlate the data that of uh, the microbiome, which we'll get, to the epidemiological data we have within the individuals, the clinical data, such as address scores, et cetera, and hopefully we'll be able to better correlate between the clinical data and microbiome data to see if there really is any real role. Of course, we'll also do immune system and metabolite analysis on the same individuals to try to get a clear uh, picture. Okay. Thanks. One quick question. Uh, per, are you talking about the, uh, there are two different ways to understand that question. One of them is 
will the bacteria, for example, work in other genetic models? Um, now we have. Ah, and other backgrounds. Excellent question. Sorry, don't have that. But that'd be very, that'd be a very good question. What we have done is we have done um, the treatment on just wild type mouse. So it's the same background without the strength limitation, and there we do not get effects um, on behavior. And more than that, we do not see the same rather drastic molecular effects that we see. So it does seem to, so that, so it seems to be pretty specific to the autism model. However, it would also translate to other models. Um, I don't know. I would. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.